issue with uh, um, screen sharing that decided to go on the maximum privacy in the wrong moment. But so, uh, Hi to all, I'm Zaluka uh, and I'm the director of the Master in Risk and Disaster Resilience. So today we are going to talk about why lateral thinking and creativity are important for disaster resilience. So a bit of background because this is a lecture that we thought through for, for a lot of time. Uh, the reason is that uh, uh, Nigel was one of the first people that invited me to have an external lecture when I was doing the doctorate and this was very particular because it was back in 2015. Nobody was caring about complex uh, risk and cascading. It was something very remote. Uh, instead, um, it was a small event, uh, relatively small, uh, Transport for London. And it was one of the first people that saw the potential of putting together different thinkers using metaphors, using conceptual thinking. So um, this is something we thought through many times. We, we discussed it for, I think now now, six years. And it's something I particularly care because I believe that uh, for facing complexity and uncertainty, we need a different approach. We need to shift uh, what we are doing and we need to shift uh, um, our thinking. So uh, let me try to share again the screen. Otherwise I will simply start my presentation. Um, without uh, the slides, because we are a bit late. So, um, okay, it's refusing to go clearly. Um, well, um, first of all, otherwise, Nigel, can you open the slide I sent you yesterday? Yes, I'll just have a see what I can do. Yeah, thank you very much, because uh, we'll do like that. Uh, if you can uh, share your screen, and I will uh, speak on it as a backup. So what is happening now, and this is connecting to what uh, we are talking today. If you think about uh, uh, complex system and uh, what we're facing now with technology, these things are not the exception. And the way we prepare for it and the way we face everything needs to consider things can go wrong. So um, I'm the mad scientist here. Thank you, Nigel. I will say next slide. Thank you. Uh, I'm the mad scientist here. Uh, as you know me, I am the director of the uh, Master in Risk, Disaster and Resilience. Uh, I'm a very addicted to coffee do some Kung Fu, and you may know me for applied work like my contribution for Science to the ARM 2020, um, the, my contribution to National Risk Assessment as a definition and classification review. This next slide. So uh, today we're going to structure it like that. I will speak about an introduction to systemic risk, uh, some basic scenario building, and uh, uh, I will proceed uh, explaining you why we need to the grounded thinking and domesticating creativity using lateral thinking. I will propose you something different new that I never did before, because I think it's about time to do it. And I found extremely complimentary what Nigel can explain in the second part of the lecture. So uh, we are gonna focus on science fiction. Uh, he's gonna explain uh, how to, how this can influence disaster risk management and how can, this can be used in scenario what if, and it's from practical experience. After all, uh, we are gonna have uh, uh, question and answer. And please be very active because uh, uh, Nigel is uh, very experienced and our view are extremely complementary. So we start from the theory. We build up already our lateral thinking, merging Nigel's experience and Nigel's knowledge about science fiction and then we are gonna uh, go for the question and answer. So please, uh, next, I'm right, perfect, thank you. And I hope, again, be very active because this is something that uh, never, we never did before and we are gonna use as a pilot also for, for other things we, we are thinking for the future. So this is, will be the basis for something else. So next slide, please, I write you in the chat. So what is a disaster, first of all? 
uh, we were used to think uh, um, basic human needs as the core problem. Instead, we have seen uh, um, that uh, there are Wi-Fi, there are problems like Wi-Fi, electricity. Everything we do is grounded. So we, there is a system of interdependency on the basis of which we act. So whatever we deploy, and we have seen it even during COVID-19, uh, that uh, below this pyramid, Nigel, uh, if you go on, um, there, is, uh, there are other things, electricity, communication, transport. The more we think about it, and the more even we consider the case we are living with COVID-19, we see that this part of the pyramid is not alone. There are concurrences, more than one thing happening at the same time. And there is the basis of infrastructure that need to be resilient. So they need to be footproofed or thought through to keep things running. So we need to consider this part here that you see as something as much as important as the part before, because it allows the, de the deployment and the continuity of services and assets. So if we think again about, think about your experience during COVID-19, uh, were you in a place where the summer was extremely hot, extremely cold? Or if you were in Germany, unfortunately, some colleagues uh, were in area affected by flooding. Or some of you, like us today, may have experienced problems like in Wi-Fi, you know? Or with the wider communication aspect. So that's why even the technical issue I had with my slides today is important. Whatever we do, it's more dependent than ever before on technology. And with COVID-19, we are already on the plan B. So part of this is already all this. So we already shifted there. The relevance and importance of this is higher. Please, next slide. Thank you. Directly. <laughs> so as you see as a whole, what is a disaster is not what we were thinking before. It's more complex and it looks like what is the next slide. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to share uh, um, the slides to the participant I've seen in the chat. Um, and you can find most of these also in our papers. So this is, for example, take it from uh, the paper we published on risk analysis. If you cannot access, just go on our search gate and use what our systemic, what systemic risk looks like. You have compound risk when so successive event, extreme events like uh, climate, uh, associated with climate change, physical, statistical, extreme interactive, like environmental drivers, like causality chain, like earthquake that uh, cause uh, a tsunami. Then we have interconnected risk. That is what we were explaining before about the interdependence of infrastructure. And then we have cascading risk. So when you have the infrastructure going down, something has come up and stuck you. What is a disaster now is complexity, is systemic risk. It's something that compared to before, my background here, you don't have just to focus on the army coming, the flooding or the earthquake or the primary event, COVID-19, you have to think everything else that happens at the same time. And we are more interconnected. So we definitely need to shift our approach. Next night, Nigel, please. So ask yourself how resilience looks like. So are there any hazards that are interacting together? So what I was thinking, what I was saying before. So have you ever been or you know of events where there was something like earthquake triggering tsunami or a storm triggering something else or a big hurricane steering a storm source? You will see that in most cases you have seen something like that. However, our mind, uh, the way we know, the way we apply knowledge tends to keep that on the side. Then you can think concurrency, the next question. Uh, is this something happened at the same time, like climate extreme? Well, most likely, yes, right? You have seen it this summer. You have seen it last summer. And then again, the next question. Are there cascading effects, secondary events escalating? Think about what happened in stacks that are far of January, power failure, uh, blackout, things that happens. And again, 
The point is the last one here. So low probability, the way we think low probability, the way our mind deal with it, doesn't mean it, all these won't happen tomorrow. It's a number that when we code it, when we put it in practice, we tend to lose the dimension. So the Murphy's law is there and the Murphy's law is always present. And as you see in this picture that uh, you can press, please. When I saw it, yes, this is the Murphy's law. It happens always when you don't expect it, but you know it can potentially happen. If, if, if or who is not familiar with the Murphy's law, if something could go wrong, it will, when the first rocket were starting. So now let's apply that better in the next slide about disaster reduction. So uh, one of the way we normally deal with preparedness to test the organizations and test uh, the way we, we, we can deal with these kind of events are scenarios. Scenarios are something that is not new. It's something that was uh, starting to get used during the 50s. Uh, from the early work, uh, I mean, was bad, but it actually helped a lot for understanding the impact of nuclear bombs and probably is one of the reasons why we never had a nuclear war, because they knew and everyone understood that there was no winning. So um, in the time, scenario evolved, a scenario were applied. We have a lot of different works uh, that explored it, including the one by Professor David Alexander, that, that for the one that uh, joined the master this year, you will still have the privilege to hear it and books. Um, so consider that all this is a process and it is based on finding hypothetical consequences of events that are constructed for focusing the attention on causal process and decision points. So what to do? We use scenario to test our capacity and to understand what to do. So according to the book uh, by David, Please, next slide. Uh, there is a normal process that starts uh, from uh, understanding historical precursors and uh, putting through a reasoning line. Next slide, please. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> and to investigate what if, what is going to happen if. So historical analysis on one side, hypothetical ingredient, we create our reference event, and then we start to understand the consequences, time one, time two, time three, and so on. We do the evaluation and we tend to understand the outcome. So in my view, this is true, is still applicable, but needs to evolve. And the way we are trying to do it, uh, please next slide, is considering what we were mentioning before, so complexity. Rising problem. So complexity and systemic risk imply higher uncertainty. You are not sure what is happening and why. You are not sure what point up you need to take decision. Like again, you don't have to think far. You need just to think of COVID. Scarcity of resources. Everybody will be prepared on everything. Your CEO, if you are in the private sector or your head of department, if you are in the public and say, no, you have half of what you want. And then you will end up instead of with, ten, with a team of 10 people, with a team of three people to do everything. And the other thing is that in many cases, the use of our technology or even what we do lacks historical precursors. So we may know the physical events, like in this case, space weather, but we don't know the extent or we can try to hypothesize the extent um, is on us. So at this point, we can consider a lot of things. Again, technological failure. If you are a around 20-ish now, or you have a certain use of technology, I see my niece that is 14, if I take her off the phone, she's doomed. I mean, the transitional generation in my late thirties, I remember what I was dealing with in my life without this. Still, if I'm in London, I get stuck without GPS. But then planning for this, how our behavior changes. Uh, what are we gonna do with the climate stream? We have some reference, right? But to what extent? Or artificial intelligence, what is the precursor, the historical pattern, that we can use for uh, artificial intelligence and then space exploration. Think about space the implication of space exploration, or even when is, this is going to happen, contact with alien form of life. It could be small bacteria without thinking about uh, green people with antennas. But even all this, what are we taking? Our mind tends to 
maybe think about other stuff, other precursor, other like a, whatever wonder. But at the end of the day, these are new experiences, and we need to deal with the difference. Next slide, please. So the key point is how do we increase our flexibility and resilience? Consider this case that is super funny. Uh, Uttar Pradesh in India, uh, secondary district, not Delhi, but pretty big industrial center. What, in your opinion, would have been a source of disruption mid June 2020? Quite big one, 20, 50 injuries, one killed. Is it COVID? There is that. That is a 19. Write down your answer. Please, Nigel, this slide. When I saw it, I was dying. So this was a, an alcoholic monkey that killed one man, creating injuries, because she was missing booze. So that's why you have to, from time to time, read the daily mail. Uh, some of the comments were even better. Somebody wrote uh, that this was 2020 in a nutshell. So this, this monkey was uh, uh, somebody that was doing a street, um, street performance and at one point got arrested or died, I don't remember. But the point is that you never know. But at this point, in that situation, you can have common elements. So please, next slide. And so how you prepare for a thing like that can have common elements to how you prepare some for something else. And there, what he, and remember that to challenge the assumption when you use something that this is for me reasonable to happen is not necessarily true. Next slide, we show you even better. There is a website that I love. Uh, you put also there also the other picture, please. So this is called Cyber Squirrel. The points you see there are accident and technological interruption due to animals. You will see that squirrels, 1,052, 252 disruptions and so on. Unfortunately, cats uh, are not recognized as they are, but they have the role. This is clearly uh, some kind of fun, but think about it, think about planning. I saw in this map, there was a nuclear site, neither of your interest, that was stuck because of jellyfish. And it was not the only case. So uh, when you start to, to think like that, you start to think, oh, maybe it's not just a matter of hazard. It's how do I need to increase the flexibility? Please, next slide. Uh, so we start to think what is common and different between hazard and vulnerability. Thinks about this big picture and thinks about that one. What is common? What is different? There is something. There could be common vulnerabilities like laces. The context could be different. Can be the same person, but the context operation is different. And we could look at that, starting on different assumption, uh, assumption, including our cultural context and our personal life story or our profession. Next slide. So, build on what you have. We need foresight and vision. So, understand what are the common vulnerabilities to different threats. See all our work from 2016 to now but also stress testing. So stress testing is trying to put all this together, go for steps, start for a single hazard, concurrency, cascading effects, and so on, to see if your organization stands and which are the common point of failure between what you know and what you don't know. And then there's something else though, because again, we lack historical precursor. Next slide, please. So it's a problem, a wider problem, how we create the condition for the business effectively. My point is that first, creativity. Um, can uh, push it through because uh, it came through afterward. Yes. So, creativity, what does it mean? Is to create the capacity to put something new and, you know, make things based on something else, you know, connect dots. You have lateral thinking that has a method for solving problems by making unusual and expecting correction between ideas. And then you have what we learn in university, for example, the scientific method. Um, the principle and procedure for systematic pursuit and knowledge, you know, methodology, what we call it in particular in the UK, being grounded. So you have creativity, the capacity to, to create and generate ideas of something new. And then 
you apply that in lateral thinking. So connecting two things are apparently different. But to do that, you use the scientific method. So you try to ground it in what you have to reinforce this connection. That brings to the next to the last slide. Right now, for preparing and increasing resilience to what we don't expect, we need to use our creativity, first of all, domesticate it into our thinking and ground it with the scientific method. And all these will help achieving disaster resilience. So preparing for the unexpected. Again, it's not just writing books, but we can use even scientific literature and science fiction in a useful way to avoid being static, to increase our flexibility and think to the unthinkable. And from now on, Nigel, your ground. Thank you, Luca. I'll just share my screen. And to all of you, this is the importance of having backups. You just seen it live. If somebody tells you, never, don't, backups are not important, always send your slide the day before to the other speakers. Okay, so just quickly about myself, um, this presentation effectively combines two of my passions. One is an interest in science fiction. I've been reading and watching science fiction since uh, a very young age, and that's uh, 55 years of my life I've been following science fiction. Um, this month actually is my 22nd anniversary of working in uh, emergency management and resilience. That's 22 years I've been doing this, and it's been a blast, I have to say. And I do welcome you to the uh, profession and encourage you to uh, to give it as much as you can. So let's start with a bit of history. So history is a hilltop. We can look forward, but we can also look back and learn from our lessons. However, one of the problems we have with history is some of it's a bit old. So if we look at you know the legend of Noah's Ark, we know there was a catastrophe, but no records, there's no witness statements, there's no lessons learned reports, it's folklore. The, um, the company that operates uh, Fukushima Daiichi actually um, did not believe that there'd been a tsunami in 869, I believe, BC, which was a catastrophic event to the uh, prefecture. So they didn't consider that they needed a major seawall, value engineered it down, and we all know the rest. So history can be useful, but it also has limits. So we can also look at trend analysis. And this is an area I'm particularly fascinated in, mainly because it allows me to do a lot of fantasy um, planning um, without enduring work time. But the problem with trend analysis, it doesn't give you decision points. It doesn't give you the what and the why, it just gives you option. So we need something else. And this is where creativity that Gianluca has been talking about. You know, if you want to go to the moon, then there's quite a few people who have been there already. Not necessarily in our reality, but science fiction authors, TV producers, directors, I've all thought through consequences, implications, what the logistics are to get. So we may not have done it a lot, but we've got a lot of literature that can help you consider risks, hazards, threats, opportunities, logistical challenges, physics. It's a whole gamut of things to consider, and we can use science fiction. So if you look at science fiction, it's influenced our society quite significantly. In the 1940s, the 60s, we can look at big engineering, space flight, huge, big optimism after World War II, big optimism to we can shape and change nature, we can benefit mankind. Then later on, we've got the threat of nuclear war and space-based weapons, you know, the high frontier that the US Congress discussed and the Star Wars program of the, uh, the Reagan presidency. But in the fiction, we got cyberpunk, we got artificial intelligence literature. The 90s, it 
the science fiction focus moved on to biotech and gen genetic engineering. And currently it's a lot about simulation and gaming. All these are affecting contemporary society. I believe the military are redesigning some of their armored personnel vehicles, tanks and aircraft so that the controls now reflect um, the type of gaming systems that our young generations use now in gaming because they're good at them. So let's start thinking about the lateral thinking of science fiction. It boils down to, frankly, people being in really weird positions, making decisions and trying to solve wicked problems. The wicked problem is when you solve one problem, more appear. A bit like the Kobayashi Maru scenario of Star Trek. Captain Kirk being the only ever person to succeed in that scenario. And he did it by cheating, as we all know from watching the movies. So science fiction literature, comics, movies, TV shows, they give us all sorts of environments to consider, whether it's based on Earth, in the present, the future, alternative versions, on other planets or in space. Lots of places to consider our options. And then this gives us the opportunity to use storytelling using the platform of science fiction to explore options and solutions to wicked problems. Science fiction has been used for, to explore political problems, social problems, um, concurrent issues where an environment, a, a technical solution then creates an environmental problem and the consequences as a movie or a series of novels, etc. So Professor Brian Toft called storytelling active learning. When people tell you about when they were at this disaster or this incident happened or this conflict or battle they participated in, and they talk about why they made decisions, rationale, and in hindsight, would they have done it this way or that way? It's storytelling. And by using this, we can explore disaster management and disaster reduction. So here's some examples. It's not comprehensive because we've only got about an hour for this whole presentation. So if you look at the zombies, hugely popular across the planet as a genre, and the CDC over in the US kind of captured this brilliantly because they realized that all the things you need for a zombie apocalypse plan is a generic plan. So by shaping it and showing it as a zombie apocalypse plan, it raised people's interest. It got people talking about it. It played with people's imaginations and it got a message into the community at multiple levels through multiple channels to get people interested and in reading about what to do in an emergency, have an emergency kit, make a plan, be prepared. It's not about being a survivor, it's being prepared, being a grown up adult looking after you and your family. So CDC did a brilliant activity and it's been copied around the world. And in the UK, Bristol City Council have done what to do in the event of a zombie invasion of Bristol. Again, it got publicity, Got people looking at it, people who would never bother looking at emergency arrangements or what if scenarios of what if we have a power outage, what if there's a food shortage or a fuel shortage. They'd never consider looking at this stuff because they don't believe in it. But science fiction is a route to the imagination which can get into people's consciousness. So if we take war gaming, um, a passion that I've had since a teenager from playing Napoleonic battles with 15 uh, millimeter lead figures through to role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and Twilight 2000. It's there. There's an excellent book, uh, The Moon Goddess and the Sun, which is a, a, uses a premise of wargaming about the Americans trying to understand the Soviets and get into their culture and how to influence them. Or also, another theme of the book is that the author actually went, well, this character from Afghanistan is going to fight the Soviets with modern technology, doing a strategic level of using drones to attack Moscow. Um, it's very akin to 9-11. So it's interesting that people can extrapolate ideas. So it's an opportunity to pick up unusual or wildcard ideas and then play with them. But if you've got skills in role-playing games or um, board games, then you can use this into wargaming 
so you can play out scenarios. Um, when I worked in London, we went, we did huge amounts of tabletop and seminar war games for the Olympic Games held in London. And this was not a security exercise or military. This was transport for London, trying to understand passenger flows and vehicle flows and the logistic challenges of delivering a successful Olympic Games in one of the world's mega cities. So again, these skills are transferable and they're useful. It allows you to use your imagination. But the other thing is, using some of the skills by rolling a D6 or a D20, a multi-sided dice, you can bring probability into your exercises. Do you actually exercise for failure? Do you exercise, we've changed out this hydraulic component in our plan and actually it doesn't work and things are not getting better? What do you do? What's the lead time for the component and the equipment? What logistic challenges has this now thrown up to you? We always exercise for success, but we should bring some probability that things don't go swimmingly well. So I'll leave that one with you on that. Simulation and VR and virtual reality has become huge. It's a cheaper way of doing things. You can't, you know, just think of the environmental impact of burning buildings, the firefighter training, environmental pollution. Now we can do it in virtual reality. It allows us to analyze decision points, actions against metrics. We can have multiple teams go through the same scenario at the same time and we can understand if our training's appropriate, if we've got the right capabilities and resources. The military use it, medics are now using it for simulating operations before they do it, and all the emergency services are actively using this. And the same for various high hazard industries, whether chemical or nuclear or, or ship or aviation, for example. Ready Player One is all very much about the virtual reality that we see today and is a, a cracking movie as well. However, in the 80s, we had Dream Park, uh, about three or four novels by Larry Niven and Stephen Barnes, who assumed that holographics and scent um, would be uh, tools to use for theme parks to give us a, the ultimate experience. And we have the famous uh, War Games movie. So there's some interesting things there. You can look for inspiration and ideas. So if we look at some of the genre about disasters, we have a whole raft of things, environmental. So John Christopher wrote about the death of grass. So massive crop failures across the planet and the consequences for state government for all for individuals. Kim Stanley Robinson talks about mass flooding. Greg Mandel uh, series by Peter Hamilton is all about Britain now being a tropical country due to climate change. Uh, if we look at the more extreme events, we've got an asteroid impact, the book Lucifer's Hammer, which is a fantastic read. I do recommend it. It also has a theme about resilience in societies, where the theme is, do people know how to make soap now that they've lost their various technological handrails? But just as much as how easy it is to make other things like chemical weapons. Then we have space weather, we're having constant moon, where a solar flare destroyed half a hemisphere and the consequences of the characters in there and test of fire by Ben Bova a similar concept where in the book the Soviet Union believes it's under a nuclear attack when it's a solar flare so we have things which is have you considered your actions and what are your triggers and would they drive you down a set route so reading some of these novels and watching movies that can just get you to free up your thinking and go have I created a rigid, logical, step-by-step -step process that does not allow questions to confirm if this works or not, or the right solution? Is it no or go? Do I launch or not? Is it too limited and boxed in? If we look at warfare, there is a whole raft of this now. Of interest, which I think is fascinating, is authors like Jerry Pennell, who, who died uh, earlier this year, I believe, um, and others looked at sort of uh, having colonial era type troops of modern equipment on different planets. Um, these, some of these novels have now become required reading at West Point and other military academies to give people 
a feel for how would you operate without that cover? What, are, what is the logistics trail now? And then we have other stuff, Red Storm Rising, how a global World War Three could have happened in the late 80s. But also of interest is the last two uh, novels that I uh, show on this screen are actually written by military professionals. A War with Russia was written in 2017 and is about a limited war in Europe. While we have an admiral discussing uh, you know, World War Three with China. So military professionals are actually moving to write fiction. In fact, Sir Richard in his foreword of the book actually states that he could only write so many papers and give so many presents to think tanks when he realised he was probably talking to no more than probably two to three hundred people would ever see these papers. So he wrote a techno thriller to get it in a wider distribution. So this follows on with the themes of feminism, politics and environmental catastrophes using science fiction to get into the community's psyche and influence them. Cyber war, it's our biggest risk in society at this moment. The National Risk Assessment goes it right up there as a significant And it is, it really is. As a professional, um, one of my biggest headaches on now seeing all of this. We spend a huge amount of time on cyber security. But the novel Neuromancer and Burning Chrome was gave us the language of cyber security and that was written in the mid eighties. We have the uh, threat casting lab in Arizona State University by using graphic novels to put across cyber security messages. And then we actually have our own fiction and um, novels. So again, we have got science fiction is driving reality. And then post disaster, we now can actually see, you know, consequences and actions. You know, the, the TV show Jericho and the graphic novel for that matter are about a limited nuclear strike by terrorists, small yield nuclear weapons detonating across America in every city, and the consequences of that. You talk about you know, contamination of water supply, politics and why these things happen. We've got Resurrection Day, which is based on a limited war, based on the Cuban crisis, a what if. Mind Star Rising, again, it's you know, Britain in a, a now subtropical environment where Peterborough is a port city. We have the second sleep, which is the viewpoint of people who survived a cyber attack, which collapsed society. The Dead of Night by Brendan Dubois, a similar theme of America has been disabled by terrorism and is slowly breaking up and restructuring, re-identifying re itself. So we can look at what people thought of the consequence of these actions, whether nuclear war, bioweaponry, chemical terrorism, or any other things we can consider from asteroids impacting to many things. And then we have the alternative, a huge hobby is looking at what if, what if the Nazis, what if the American Civil War had gone different directions? And there's a lot of literature there and it allows us to think about what are the tools the authors are using. And in some ways it's backcasting. They're looking back and going, the American Civil War would have been different if X moment did not happen or this general decided to send their troops left, not right. And, and we can play a great game of you know, logic against conception. So again, it gives you the opportunity to consider the future and the past and alternative decision. I think this intellectual thinking again. So in summary, history is great for fighting the last battle as a general and giving insights, but it has limits. Through storytelling, we can pique people's imagination we can explore critical thinking and we can look at different situations from different perspectives. The old story of walk a mile in my shoes. So as emergency planners, we can sit there and think about for the off-site nuclear plan for nuclear license site X, what are we telling the public? If you were a member of the public and you've just received a text message, or a mobile phone message, or hear air raid type warning sirens, what would I do? Where would I go? Where are my kids? How do I get to their school? Do I have enough food in my house? 
all the things you would consider and the consequences. An example again is Fukushima, the one vulnerable group that no one ever thought about in all the planning, and this is not incompetence, it's just the size and scope of planning for nuclear accidents, is pregnant women. You know, they have mobility issues, they have needs, they have more psychosocial issues than others, and they'll be fearing for the future. How are you accommodating them in your emergency plans? So again, this allows you to bring gender analysis into the community-based emergency plans. Who's affected? Is it the elderly? Is it the very young? Is it male or female? What's the consequence? A good example is looking at COVID. Who are the winners and losers in the community through a COVID pandemic? And that's an example I'll leave with you to consider. It's also active learning. We're thinking outside the box. It's building flexibility through resilience to change in the unexpected. If you're not planning for black box, this is a scenario. And in the event of an accident, I've got 26 manuals. I'll just pull off the shelf and they'll tell me what to do. It allows you to have a framework of thought as opposed to just a set of actions to follow blindly without thought. Science fiction covers a whole raft of things. But it does allow us to explore moral issues, logistics, what if? You know, what if we had a tsunami from a volcano uh, erupting in the Azores? What would that do for a tsunami striking the European but also the US and South America and the Caribbean? What would that do? What would you do about it? What can you do about it today? What is the likelihood? Authors and TV shows, etc., they've gone through this thought process. So, by looking at some of this stuff, it gives you the opportunity to consider that. So, I'm going to leave you one question, um, which is a rhetorical question is how do we make this systematic? The late author, Bob Shaw, used to say to his wife that uh, he was going to do market research and he'd go and get a paperback book and go and sit on the sofa and read for a few hours. So, that might be a bit difficult to explain to your line manager that you're just doing some uh, what if planning by reading a sci fi novel in your office. So I'll leave you with that and hand you back to Jean. You're muted, Jean Luca. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I was, uh, for me, all this uh, makes me wonder all the time, and I could go on speaking with you for hours. There was, or, there were already a couple of comments. The first one by David, and I want you to come to to uh, to say what you think about it because we had already a discussion. There is a lot of value in role play games like Dungeons and Dragons for promoting lateral thinking, and even require it to be successful in a campaign. Your comment on this? Oh, you know, could you repeat again? You broke up, I'm afraid. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so David made a comment, and please, everyone, uh, do add your question in the chat. Uh, he was suggesting that there is a lot of value in role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons for promoting lateral thinking, and even uh, requiring uh, to be successful in a campaign. What is your point of view? So my point of view is, um, if you played. Um... Uh, these games, uh, I've been an avid fan of them over the years, is you build your character. So you, know, you have your character, you give them attributes, you equip them. So you could do that the same with your emergency response organisation. What are you equipping your people with? What behaviours and training are you looking for? What competencies? Equipment, vehicles, and all of that. And in some of the role-playing games, you have a budget, you know, uh, in the Twilight 2000 game, you have some like 20,000 US dollars to play with and you can buy your equipment. But again, that gives you a logistics uh, experience and knowledge to consider out what's my budget, what do I need. But again, it also comes into, if you're a dungeon master, you've created your scenario, what are the action points you want to drive from people, what behaviours, what are your success criteria? And then you build your environment. What's the weather going to be for the exercise? Example, what time of day? Is it in real time or is it in accelerated time where we do time jumps? How you were doing a game. So if you think you're in a game, your heroes are all sat in the tavern waiting for some mystic person to come up and give them a quest to follow. 
So that's the dungeon master. That's you. You're the game master or the exercise director. And you're coming to people saying, right then, folks, you're the emergency response team for um, a certain healthcare organization or police or UPA licensed site. And so you're here. The time is this. This is the date. This is the weather. This is what's going on in a nuclear site. And this has just happened. What do we do next? And you spin out from there. Um, there are just seen the, in the chat about scenarios. There are many around. Um, and you will find a lot of consultancy have catalogs of exercises, and a lot of um, organisations that regularly carry out exercises will keep records on them as they may want to repeat those exercises. Or they may want to um, um, tweak them in the future. Yeah, and on that I can also follow up. Uh, if you are talking about the program of uh, risk and disaster resilience, the short answer is hell yeah, <laughs> because uh, for me are essential part of teaching. Uh, both in uh, IRDR 003 advanced emergency planning, but uh, in business continuity, uh, we are actually doing. Uh, um, Nigel, you may be interested that. Uh, the scenario, I think you were present on space weather, the one we did with our stakeholder back with uh, when Robert was uh, was with us. Uh, and it was something done uh, also with the participation of the Met Office. So we adapted it clearly not to uh, use any kind of uh, confidential information, but to push through the idea that uh, the event uh, may be different what you expect. But there are many. We are also having a chat with the... Um, other, well, I mean, with a lot of organizations uh, on this, uh, we'll probably have Jeremy from London Resilience having uh, a scenario, a strategic scenario for IRDR 03, and we are discussing about the host organization for the yearly scenario. So there will be many. Uh, plus, we are promoting also others with our stakeholders, and one of which, Nigel, I need to throw you into, by the way, we'll have a separate conversation on this. David, uh, um, we have a rather, okay. Okay, authority first response, yes. Well, I think so, but it depends. Uh, I'm referring to David's question about the rocket ma manufacturing site on the outskirts of uh, your town. I hope uh, they use lateral thinking and I hope they also look, watch the YouTube what happens when something goes wrong because there is uh, something like that that's happening with a terrible blast. If you go on YouTube, a massive blast due to uh, rocket fuel. Uh, so I hope so, but I cannot comment because I don't know where are you exactly, Nigel? Um, what I would suggest is that um, um, facilities like that carry a set of hazards. So they're probably regulated by uh, various organisations. So there may be some uh, chemical hazard industry re regulation, uh, explosives. There'll be a, a, some series of regulation like, mapped against the hazards and quality held. And it's also particularly good practice under the Health and Safety and Management at Work Act in the UK, if you're based in the UK. Uh, that would drive you to do some exercising and training and exercising your emergency response or management team. Yeah, uh, it was it is based in the UK, don't remember exactly where, <laughs> my, my fault. Another question really interesting by Andrea. Can science, can it change the buy-in? Like, with space weather, I hope so. Uh, a bit what, what I've seen myself uh, after uh, the TV series Cobra, uh, before they, when I was speaking about, uh, speaking about space weather and the implication of it, uh, nobody had a clue what it was. They're still looking at me like a nerd when I mention it uh, in uh, less many organizations, but uh, it changed a bit the buy-in. Uh, from, uh, let's put it, like CEOs, they, they already heard them, uh, still, uh, it's a long way to go. But I think uh, the narrative has a massive role in supporting how we prepare for less frequent events and how we create a narrative around it. It can strengthen or weaken our effort. That's the last my take. What do you think, Nigel? Yes, uh, it's a very good question from Andrea. There's a, a superb book called Warnings by Richard A. Clark. Um, and he basically, he names people such as uh, Noah as Cassandras, people who are technical experts in their field, whether it's finance, engineering, 
scientologists um, seismologists and archaeologists who have put warnings out and have been completely ignored and then it's all gone horribly wrong so it does happen and it's a real world problem and the, the only thing i can suggest is if you're ever in that position is make sure everything you can put forward is fact-based and that you record decisions you made them and what the rationale was at the time because if you do end up in a public inquiry then at least you can explain what you did to try and avert this. But again, if we can get into the storytelling of this, we can get people's imaginations and then they will buy in and go, yeah, I can see a logic. I can see why this may happen, why we may want to do something. Yeah, um, I make another point on this, um, connected to another comment by David. So um, I find very important that uh, in some cases, uh, I get concerned if nobody tells me I'm crying wolf. And the reason is that uh, if you do your job properly and if you use lateral thinking from time to time, you are behind everyone. And to me, it happened with the, with the paper, the, the, the scenario did the compare space weather with JNS failure. And one of the comments of the reviewer was just your crying wolf about a cyber attack on JNS. After two months, I received that review, it happened. So one of the important elements of uh, for me, the narrative is going beyond that. It is shaking the rigidities of thinking. Um, exactly. Yeah, as an uphill, uh, David suggested, is an uphill battle. And even when I talk with colleagues more in the private sector from time to time, the, the, the core point is that we don't have the resources or we don't have a leadership by him. Uh, when we're talking about borrows, I mean, they would like to do everything, but they simply don't have the capacity because they have budget cuts, they are exhausted. Uh, in time of COVID, they've been, been like deployed, uh, de deployed on first response for one year and a half. So it's extremely important, again, using lateral thinking, using our creativity to understand where we can be efficient, from where we can have the buy-in and where we cannot have the buy-in. So this common point of failure, we can prepare that, putting together things that are apparently different. That's the less what I believe is the future. Nigel, do you want to have a final comment on this? Yeah, I, I think it, it is, it can be particularly painful experience when you're sat there with executives and you're saying our worst um, risk nationally is pandemic flu and we might want to provide all our workforce and say 2,000 odd people with flu vaccination and someone will then come back and go we can't afford it we can afford 200 300 and you have to then go well actually is it actually a waste of time or can we target that what we can afford to specific critical workers who are within a particular range range where they would not get a flu vaccination for free? so there are challenges sometimes you work gas and you have to accept it other times you can hide some of the left field things in all hazard preparations where uh, an incident management for say a security event could be the same as if you had a uh, chemical explosion and so you can uh, build in resilience by using an all hazard approach as opposed to specific for sorry or that scenario but it is difficult sometimes you have to work with what you that's the best Yes, uh, so um, last comment, then uh, it's time to sum up. Um, sometimes Andrea suggests sometimes a consequence based plan could be instead of a risk based plan. I totally agree with it. And in the approach we are proposing in the next GAR, so the one you are going to see in 2022, our contribution suggests to use Igor's Linkos approach to, toward the risk agnostic, but to integrate that more with what in business continuity is used uh, and associated with business impact analysis. So prioritization of services and, and what is more important to keep alive also done at the societal level and organizational level. So moving beyond just considering hazard a single threat, thinking in terms of scenarios uh, to move to, to what are the common point of failure and overall making them bulletproof independent of what it comes because this can help preparing what we know already, historic and what we, we know it could happen potentially, but where there is a higher uncertainty and also what we, we don't see coming. Nigel, do you have a final comment on this and any other final comments? I think uh, where I'd like to end it, I think for me, it's one of the interesting 
things you can do with looking at science here is it gives you lots of options to think of what if, what if my rocket propellant plant exploded or had a fire or whatever. And there's lots of examples you can draw out of science fiction, which gives you someone's already thought through decision making processes and actions. So you can extrapolate ideas there. Or I think for me is to say, well, if this rocket plant just had a major explosion, so how would I go back in time to stop? To actually work back in a, a sequential event and go, where's the decision point that if I said, right, we put a blast wall here? Or we don't keep quantities and materials next to each other, or we have a different layout. Working backwards to go, how could we have stopped the event from happening? And then you can then go, what's the most cost effective, timely, and what can I sell to executives? So you have opportunities to do that. It just gives you a broader scope to look at incidents and emergency and how you can prepare for them. But it gives you the opportunity to look at different perspectives. Rather than being the protagonist, you're the sideshow. You're the member of the public. You're the emergency responder. You're the director of a song. And so on. you know, the chief executive of business gives you options. Okay, so if uh, there is uh, not uh, any other questions, I would say, Sarah, that uh, it's time for us uh, um, to close the session. Thank you all of you for attending and you will have this video on YouTube. I'm going to spam this uh, on LinkedIn because I believe what Nigel shared today is very important and uh, is uh, the basis for going beyond uh, what we are doing and uh, knowledge as we know it. Again, uh, we are living in a time of high uncertainty um, and uh, keeping conservative approach makes sense up to a one point because we need to adapt to things that we know but also we don't know or never experienced so whatever help us to increase the flexibility and again domesticate our creativity in a grounded way is going to help us so please do have some read to the science fiction list uh, by nigel check again his blog uh, on our uh, um, institute's blog so if you didn't see it and I hope it's going to be interesting. It was interesting as much as it was for me. I have a, a list of books <laughs> recommended by Nigel that uh, I am going to read in the next weeks. And Nigel, thank you again. It was amazing. And we are going to forward this up uh, a lot. Thanks for your time, folks. And thank you, Gianluca. And Sarah, thank you. <laughs>